Okay, great. Well, so thanks everybody. My name is Nicole Key. I'm here on behalf of Eckerd Grohl, who couldn't make it today. So it's my honor to introduce Ivan Kristoff, one of our outstanding associate professors in mechanical engineering. Um, Ivan is uh, established himself as a, an incredible scholar in fluid mechanics, and especially in the areas of suspension dynamics, interface dynamics, and flow-induced deformation. Um, his applications for his research are very broad, and they include areas such as biomedical devices, hydraulic fracture, microfluidics, and soft robotics. So he's the guy that everybody wants to work with in ME when they have special applications that could use his expertise. Um, one of the things I think I really wanted to point out, maybe because I'm a grad chair in ME, is that he received the Outstanding um, Mentor Award voted upon by our graduate students. So he is um, takes his job seriously in all aspects. He's an amazing instructor for our fluid mechanics area as well. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ivan and uh, take it away. All right. <clears throat> thank you, Nicole, for the introduction. And thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us here today. It's a, it's a pleasure to be up here. Uh, maybe I'll start off with a little joke. Uh, I don't know how many of you are old enough, I think some of you are, to remember the, the cult classic film Clerks from the 1990s. Uh, it's one of the original Kevin Smith movies. Uh, the protagonist Dante here that you see, he keeps repeating this quote throughout the entire movie. I'm not even supposed to be here today. Uh, <laughs> and and wh 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 why is that relevant? Uh, technically I'm on sabbatical, but the organizers, uh, we're very insistent that I'm here. And so I am here at Purdue right now. So I thought, OK, I'll, I'll join. And I'll be happy to talk about uh, uh, what I'm doing. But I just wanted to uh, sort of make some of you jealous, maybe, that next week I'm back on, on my sabbatical travels. And uh, this will be my view uh, for the first couple of days, at least. Uh, I'll actually be in the Republic of Cyprus. So it's this uh, tiny island here off the coast of, uh, of, of Syria and Turkey. Uh, in the far eastern Mediterranean. Uh, I'll be, I'm there courtesy of the Department of State's Fulbright program, and I'm doing some research at the University of Nicosia. Uh, it's a very interesting place. Uh, there's two stats I want to mention to you about it. Uh, in fact, their first major research university was founded in, or opened in 1992, and didn't graduate students until 94, or 96, I guess, maybe four years. I don't know when they started. Yet, if you read the statistics, it's, it's considered to be the most educated country in Europe, judging by the number of uh, higher degrees per capita. And you might say, well, how can they have like, a single research university? Well, they have some smaller universities, and a lot of people go to Greece. Uh, Cyprus, at least the Republic of Cyprus, is, is Greek-speaking, so they go to Greece to get their degrees. But it's kind of an interesting place, right? It's very educated, but there are sort of major research universities, of which there's basically one and a half, let's say, uh, are only about 30 years old. And so it's kind of very interesting to be there and to, to kind of to elaborate on some new research initiatives with the, uh, with the faculty there. So, so don't, for those of you who, you know, some of the colleagues here who got tenure or are about to get tenure and will have a sabbatical, uh, the Fulbright program is a, is a great way to go, do something new and interesting. Okay, so that's my, my plug about my, my, uh, my view next week. Uh, but let me tell you a little bit about my research group so I wouldn't be here without the, the, the significant efforts of the very talented students and researchers that I work with. Uh, so here's the evolution of the group from 2017, that was my second year at Purdue, to 2021. Uh, I guess we didn't take a picture last year, and 2020 is missing as well. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't take our customary uh, Zoom photo. Uh, but, but what do we do? So the name for the group is Transport Modeling Numerics and Theory. It's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, but what we're interested in is transport. So how, how do things flow? Where do they go? Why do they flow? How do they flow? Uh, we have to come up with basic equations for that, uh, mathematical theories, that's the modeling part. We have to solve them somehow, either using mathematics or, or simulations or something else. And, and we like to have fun as well, so you might notice that the, that the acronym for the lab, TMNT, also, also spells something that some of us from the 90s might remember, <laughs> the, the Teenage Ninja Mutant Turtles. Uh, so that's an Easter egg, uh, if anybody caught it, but here it is. Uh, so so wh wh what do we work on? We work on many things, uh, as Nicole mentioned. Uh, here's a little collage of some of them. It's not, ex it's not exhaustive. Uh, but the things that we're very active in is uh, flow-induced deformation. So you see here is actually a collaboration with uh, uh, Vitaly Reyes in biomedical engineering. Uh, this is uh, flow in an aneurysm. So this is a model created from an actual 
MRI image of an aneurysm in a patient. And we've running simulations here where you see the flow in there. That's what the streamlines are showing you, as well as the deformation of it. On a more basic level, we're just interested also in the deformation of things like just channels, a rectangular channel, a very basic kind of uh, fluid mechanical uh, uh, problem. We're also working on suspensions. That's what the picture on the right is. So it's a kind of particularly interesting uh, micromixer element uh, in which there's a suspension flow and you see the particles, uh, which are quantified by the volume fraction in, in color. They kind of seem to go to the corners up here. And we can explain that and have some detailed simulations of that as well. Uh, somewhere in my past, I also worked on granular materials. These are powders. So here you see some interesting patterns. That's from my PhD work of how red particles and black particles separate and, and form really interesting patterns in when they're agitated in certain ways. Uh, so that's sort of a little overview of what we do. But uh, I'd like to tell you sort of how we think about research. I think that's maybe helpful for those of you who are not in the field, and maybe even the students. Uh, first of all, our mission statement is kind of a mouthful. Right? We're interested in things that are, that are flowing, fluids, solids, gases. We like to explain experiments that people have uh, made on this kind of things, and like to make progress on fundamental problems, basic stuff. And that's really my goal in my research, has been for a long time, is to we want to generate new knowledge. We want to see something, something that, something that somebody has observed, measured in an experiment, and we'd like to explain it. And if we can, then maybe we generate some new knowledge, right? some new fundamental insights. And so in the limited time that I have, uh, I'll tell you about uh, just one of the, the major research directions and a little bit of our success there uh, to do so. Maybe, oh, sorry, I forgot. Before, before I tell you about that, uh, that particular example, let me tell you how, how we go about research, right? We're interested in generating new scientific knowledge. And, and you know, before I was at Purdue, I actually spent two years as the Richard P. Feynman postdoctoral fellow at Los Alamos National Lab. And so I read some of uh, uh, Richard Feynman's writings. He has a lot of them. Maybe many of you have read them as well. Uh, popular books and stories and so forth. But I was sort of interested in you know, how he thought about research. And because at that time I was a postdoc, I was think, trying to figure out what am I going to do? How am I going to think about research if I want to be a faculty member? And one, one very nice quote is at the very top, where he says, this is a letter he wrote to one of his students uh, 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 who asked some questions to him. So he says, it, the, the worthwhile problems are the ones you can really solve or help solve. All right, so if you can make a contribution, you should. I think that's, that's the way I read it, right? No problem is too small or too trivial if you can really make a new contribution, generate some new knowledge, solve the problem. And another quote that I really like from him, it's a little bit different. Uh, this, this is a very famous address he gave to, uh, to, Caltech, uh, to Caltech's undergraduates in 1974, the commencement address. It's, uh, it's called Cargo Code Science. There's a lot of interesting things in there. But one, things he talk, think he talk, one thing he talks about is the, the importance of integrity in scientific research. And he can read, he can read a number of different ways. But, but this sort of quote always stuck out, uh, st stood out to me, the bending over backwards to show you may be wrong, right? So you have to be your, in science, sometimes you have to be your own biggest critic. You have to make sure whatever you're saying really is true. You can back it up. You can, you can, uh, you really have discovered something new, you know, just making big, bold claims to get some press, right? So I think that's, that's sort of one thing that also st struck me about how he thought that you should sort of take on. No problem is too small, but even then you should just you should make sure that whatever you're doing is important and correct and, 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 you've, and, you've, and you've really made sure of that. Okay, so uh, I will show you one technical slide. And this is actually a slide from my course, ME308. Uh, this is the undergraduate fluid mechanics course in, in, uh, in mechanical engineering. And it's about flow in a pipe. So this is what we call fully developed laminar flow, flow in a pipe down here. Uh, this is something that every mechanical engineer, every civil engineer, anyone who has to do anything to do with flows learns about. How does a fluid flow in a pipe? And one, one very fundamental thing we know about that, this back to the 1800s, is this so-called uh, hagen poiset law. So it tells you that if you have a pipe, here it is, just a piece of pipe, and you have some flow coming in, some, some amount of fluid, then the amount of that you can push through, the flow rate, the amount of fluid per unit time, is directly uh, proportional to the pressure drop, so the pressure difference, the amount of force, you're applying to push the fluid through. And in one small miracle, this, this, this proportionality can be derived from the basic equations of fluid mechanics as this equation here in the middle, right? So the fluid's viscosity, the length of the pipe, the radius of the pipe, and some numbers like eight and pi show up. Right? So it's a very basic fundamental law. Everybody who's ever studied any kind of pipe flows, hydraulics, has to learn about it. This back to Hagen and Poise. Uh, one of the, the things that I'm most proud of from what we've done in our research group in the last six years is we, we've kind of come up with generalizations of this law that we call sort of soft hydraulics. 
So I say, okay, well, this is for a rigid pipe, going back to the 1800s, where the pipe can deform due to the flow. As right, so the pipe changes shape, that changes the flow, the flow deforms the pipe back and forth. It's, it's coupled in this kind of infinite loop. And so we've developed sort of a very general theory, what we call soft hydraulics, of how this flows go through, uh, through soft confinements. And so here's like one equation that we've come up with, but, but I'm pretty, particularly proud of that is because this is sort of a, a mathematical result, right? Just like how the hagen poise law, here's the viscosity, the length, this is for a channel, the height, the width, and then there's some other stuff here that we actually have calculated uh, exactly, starting from the basic equations of fluid mechanics and solid mechanics, right? This thing can deform, so you need to know some fluid mechanics and some solid mechanics. Anyway, so along the way we got some press, so for example, uh, uh, we had a nice, this, this sort of nice little story that came out rewriting the book on on the fluid mechanics of blood vessels because it turns out once we solve this, these equations got this kind of basic laws from scratch. It turns out some of the equations you will find, for, for example, for blood vessels, which are deforming pipes in some of the biomechanics textbook were not quite accurate. And we got some attention for that here. This was an editor's choice article in this journal, which has a very, very long name. But some of you in fluid mechanics might recognize this. This is the journal where Pranto published his boundary layer theory in the 1900s. So it's kind of a well-known mechanics journal, even though it's kind of hard to, hard to pronounce if you're not German. Uh, anyway, so I think I have only about a minute or two left. So I want to say one, one particular place where I see a lot of applications of, of our results, and that's why I'm very excited about them, is in this idea of microfluidic hydraulic circuits. So maybe some of you have seen this very nice analogy between electrical circuits and hydraulic circuits, right? A battery can generate a, a voltage difference, which can drive uh, electric current, and resistors can slow down or provide resistance. In, a, in the fluidic analogy, a pump can provide a pressure difference, which can drive a flow, and then deformations, contractions of the pipe can lead to uh, resistance. And that's very classic based on sort of rigid pipes. Now if the pipes are soft, as I showed you before, then this resistance to the flow can depend also not just on the pipe, prop and, the pipe and the fluid properties, but on the pressure itself. So some kind of self-regulating kind of resistor. And people were thinking about that in particular. I was very excited. There's a group in Denmark that I just saw in November who are trying to use our theory to explain certain, certain features of self-regulating biological uh, valves. So there's certain uh, uh, valves in the circulatory system of animals and mammals uh, that can have some certain self-regulating properties. And that can be maybe explained by the fact that they're not rigid pipes, they're soft pipes, and the resistance can depend on the pressure. So that's one little interesting thing that I want to point out. Uh, so anyways, I, I should say something about what's next, and I think my time is running out. Uh, there's a lot of interesting things that, uh, that I would like to work on. We've, we've, we've figured out hydraulic resistance, but what about capacitance, impedance? These are also concepts from, hydro from electrical circuits that can be generalized to hydraulic circuits, and I think we don't know anything about them. Uh, so, so I'd like to do that. And maybe if you can take just 10 more seconds. Uh, I was really uh, curious to see this, this uh, story. APS is the American Physical Society. That's the major society in my field. And uh, Sidney Nagel from the University of Chicago, who actually works in my area. Uh, I've read a lot of his papers. He won the APS medal, which is the highest medal for research given by the society. And this was just last month. And he was asked, you know, so now that you, you know, you've reached the, the top of the field, you won the biggest research medal from your society, what, what are you going to do next? If there's one problem you could work on, what would it be? If there's one thing you can solve and become famous for, what would it be? And he says, you know, no, I'm not interested in that. <laughs> I'll just try to have fun. It's very much the process that's fun. And, and, I, and I kind of like that, right? It's, it's about discovering things. It's about no problem is too small. It's about sort of solving something and, and, and the pleasure is in that, not necessarily in, in getting a lot of uh, fame. So anyways, I think my time is up and I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks, Ivan. Are there any questions for him? So I saw that you work on the soft hydraulic circuits, and the applications that you mentioned were more towards, you know, biology, like blood vessels and things. Are there like any engineering applications too? Yeah. So I think the the, the applications of the hydraulic things to to blood vessels, things like that, are the easiest ones to to I think uh, uh, kind of understand to visualize. But actually, microfluidics people are very interested in this as well because you would like to miniaturize uh, things like uh, assays and, and testing and things like that to, to sort of small devices, tiny channels etched on a, on a little soft uh, PDMS chip. And in that case, you have to understand the hydraulic circuit as well. You have to know how much pressure you have to put in to drive the, the, the flow through it. Maybe you have a reagent that has to mix with something if you're doing an assay or test. And I think people are very interested in that, in, in, in that area as well. In fact, actually, my, my interest in this arose from that, from microfluidics. People are trying to design labs on a chip. And, and we saw some problems there had not been understood or solved. Okay. Yeah, thank, thanks yeah. a lot.
Anyone else? Yeah, uh, hi, firstly, thanks a lot for your talk. It was really interesting and informative. So I, I had a question on basically how you approach research, because you already spoke about it, right? So uh, I, I've noticed that you have done a lot of theoretical work, as you showed from that beautiful equation. So uh, I, and you told that you want to work on problems that you can solve. So how is it that you find, like, what's the process behind that? You know, finding problems that are easy enough to solve and are also, I mean, they are also important. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think every, every PhD student has to eventually face that question. Uh, what is the problem you can solve and is actually worth solving? Um, you know, it's not, it's not very easy to answer. Sometimes we attempt to solve a problem we don't, or, or we put it aside, it takes a long time, we come back to it and figure it out. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of hard. So I think it takes a lot of sort of guessing and iterations, I would say, and, and I think working with sort of talented students and postdocs, I think, helps a lot. So we sit down and we, we brainstorm the ideas. Like, okay, so you know, somebody measured this, they didn't explain it, can we explain it? And then we start working on it and see, see, see how far we can go. And if we can't, maybe we sort of put it aside and go back. Um, but, but maybe just to, to make one particular point is that, yeah, we do a lot of theory, but we're driven by, by sort of questions in the field, right? So maybe you read a paper, somebody has measured something, and they say, we don't know why this depends on that, but they measured it, right? X depends on Y. There was a measurement, uh, Y. And so that's, that's kind of how we usually start on finding problems that we think are interesting to solve. Somebody's measured something, they can explain it, maybe we can. And then, and then whether we can or not depends a lot, right? So I think there's been always some dead ends in every, in every research program, every PhD. But you kind of try to, try to iterate until you find the one you can solve. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? We have time for one more. Well, Ivan, I guess I, I can ask a quick question. So since you won that mentoring award, do you have any advice for some of maybe the junior faculty sitting in here who uh, could, you could kind of share some of the, the keys that you think led to that award that your students really appreciate about your mentoring style? Um, sure. So I guess you know, everyone has their own mentoring style. Everyone has their different research groups. Some are small, some are big. I think what works for me, because the kind of research that we do is to maintain sort of a smaller research group maybe, uh, four to five graduate students at any given time and kind of work, work closely with them, right? Especially if we have to kind of come up with some, some, some theory, solve some difficult equations. I think it helps a lot to, to, to work hand in hand. So it's kind of very collaborative style. So at least that's my style of mentoring them. And I think some students have appreciated that. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing that I think some of them appreciated and maybe wrote about in that nomination was that, you know, kind of helping them uh, figure out what, what they want to do as well, right? So, I have one student wanted to pick up a master's in statistics to, to help her also with her mechanical engineering PhD get into something more, more, uh, some more, some more different kind of fields like machine learning and data science, things like that applied to engineering. And so I think being, being supportive and trying to figure out a way to, to help them do that while also getting our research done, I think they appreciated it. So kind of try, trying to help them realize their own, their own goals as well as uh, kind of working hands on with them. Great, thank you. Oh, we got another question way back in the corner. Ivan, so this is a question very specifically for you know, a fluid mechanics professor, right? What's your favorite non-dimensional number? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if there were to be a Christoph number, right, based on all these you know, flexible hydrodynamics, what would it capture? What's not been captured by, by those numbers? Two-part question. <laughs> Yeah, what's my favorite one? Well, I think I think uh, Reynolds number will be two, will be two, too, too simple. That's, that's everybody knows about that one is their favorite. But but in fact, we did we did actually, in, in all of this, there is a non-dimensional number here. It's it's hiding somewhere in this expression. It involves a pressure, a Young's modulus, and some geometric factors. And so that that number, we we, we were we were boring. We called it the uh, fluid structure interaction parameter. Uh, a big mouthful, <laughs> but it is a dimensionless number that that quantifies how much can the walls, the channel, bend, uh, depending on the pressure within the channel. So if it's very low, it cannot bend very much. Very little deformation, no matter how much pressure you put in, if it's very high, you get a lot of deformation for the pressure. Uh, maybe a compliance parameter might be a better thing, but there's one very particular one that comes out of here that involves like a width, a height, a Young's modulus, and a, and a pressure drop. <laughs> so maybe that's my favorite one right now. <laughs> or there's many versions of it depending on the geometry, but. Okay, all right, thank you so much. Sure.